Hello everyone and welcome back to this next lecture. In this lecture we are going to talk about smart grids. So smart grids are being immensely used nowadays whenever we talk about the future power system grid. right? So the question is obviously what makes a grid smart versus what it is now. right? So the question is what is it that is new about this smart grid that we are all talking about as a future. The answer simply speaking is in a smart grid we now have communication, remote sensing, remote monitoring, supervisory control, event prediction and many many more. So basically we have pretty much the same system except that now we have fitted in a lot of digital technologies. Right? So now let's take a look at why this is such a good thing. In a conventional system that is a usual power system almost all corrective action is taken locally and then regionally onwards to prevent it affecting the larger grid. So for example, let's say there is a short circuit in a house. If there is a short circuit in a house, typically the circuit breaker or the fuse of the house will blow first so that the short circuit does not affect the rest of the system. That it does not affect other apartments, it does not affect other buildings, it does not affect other houses. Right? This is how you isolate a fault. Now the problem is that in recent times we now have to act much faster to prevent damage to other equipment because there is a short circuit or a fault at a given place. The usual forms of short circuit protection is now changing because reason is our appliances have changed. Right? This usual conventional behavior results in slow performance. And now in today's day and age, our appliances have changed. For example, our washing machine now has a microcontroller. Our dishwasher has a microcontroller. The refrigerator has another microcontroller. Things which once upon a time were simple passive devices are now becoming smart. They have electronics. They are connected to the Alexa. They are connected to Google Home. All kinds of things. The result is these appliances are now way more sensitive and way more delicate than what they were before. And because of this, we need to take much faster action to make sure that these appliances are protected and the quality of power remains stable. Moreover, and this I'll talk about soon, a conventional grid also curtails the integration of renewable energy sources for the simple reason that when we connect renewable energy sources, we are connecting them close to the load centers. The result is we are changing the pattern of how power is consumed or produced at the load center. And this can sometimes disturb the system. Which is why most conventional systems put limits in the amount of renewable energy that can be connected anywhere. So therefore, to solve all these problems, that is change in consumer behavior, more sensitive appliances, and also most importantly the spot pricing of electricity because of which electricity can now, the price can change by every hour. So therefore, the future grid now has to be much faster and also has to be able to accommodate all these changes. That is the reason why we need a smart grid. So now let's talk about where does, what is a typical smart grid? Again, as I said, it's very, very complicated and there's a lot of technology that you need to describe to be actually able to make sense out of what is a smart grid? But in rough sense, I'll talk about a basic difference between a usual grid and what might be called as a smart grid. So let's take a typical radial distribution system that could be feeding a city. All right, any city. I live here in Hamburg, Germany. This could be Hamburg. This could be Tokyo. This could be Delhi. It could be anything. So let's say, for example, that the entire city is fed by a very high voltage line. This is usually, let's say, 220 kV, it could be 400 kV, it could be anything, right? It's a very high voltage line. Now, this high voltage line is usually divided into several parts. I've shown two, but it can be 10, could be anything, all right? So, these different locations would supply different parts of the city. They could supply the core city, it could supply suburbs, different things. It, it, again, it's completely dependent on how the city planners decided to supply the power to the city. Now from each and every part, at each and every part of these 
the bus which I'm showing here, this horizontal line of buses, you can have loads connect. For example, it is quite normal to have factories and high consumers connected at high voltages outside the city. For example, if you have a cement factory or you have a car manufacturing factory, these are bulk consumers of power and they need to be connected at high voltage. As we keep coming down, the low voltage keeps decreasing, you would have smaller and smaller commercial centers as well. For example, it is quite normal for any city to have an industrial area and several industrial areas and these industrial areas will have little manufacturing units such as soap making, box making, you name it. And all these will also be connected at slightly higher voltage than what we get as consumers. And as we keep coming down, eventually we come down to the distribution level voltage, which is either 400 volt line to line in Europe, or it could be 208 volt line to line in North America, depends on where you live. And this is where household consumers are connected. So these are houses, these are apartment buildings, these are office buildings, all these are supplied at this level, which is usually which is called household distribution voltage. So this is a typical radial distribution system. And as I already said, we have different forms of protection. For example, if there's a fault at any one point, you would want to isolate that part, right? So that this fault at one of them does not affect the others. This is very normal. So now let's look at what happens if this becomes a smart grid. It's exactly the same grid, right? Only now I've put all these circles. What are these circles? Each part of the grid is monitored. So it means it has sensing. You are always sensing the voltage, the current, the power produced, everything. Every event is recorded. Everything that happens is recorded. And each and every part of the grid, which is being monitored, that is you're measuring everything, it also communicates with different parts of the grid. So for example, each and every building can have sensing. You're sensing what is the current drawn, what is the voltage, everything. And they are all communicating and talking to each other. So every building knows what every other building is doing. Similarly, you can have an outer communication zone. So for example, let's say you have 20 buildings in a street. All these 20 buildings could have one supervisory control who knows every current in each and every building. All right. Each and every building is now being monitored by a supervisory control. And this entire entire system is being monitored by a supervisory control. So we have layers and layers and layers of monitoring and control and communication. Now, we already know some of this even in a conventional system. It's called SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So this smart grid is, you could say SCADA on steroids, right? So we already have all that. We are just adding more digital technologies, more communication, more planning, more monitoring. That's all there is to it. So now, now that we've talked about this, the question is, what does this have to do with power electronics? As I said, this entire course is to talk about applications of power electronics. So it's important to understand, as I said, that the most important reason for having a smart grid is we need super fast control. We need to be able to control very fast to any event and also ensure that power is moved about in a much more efficient way. That's what this is all about. And because of that, the usual equipment like traditional voltage regulators, spike suppressors, and even circuit breakers, these are all being replaced by power electronic components. Because remember, a circuit breaker will take several cycles to break the current. Voltage regulators may take several cycles before they correct the voltage. And in modern systems, that may not be fast enough. Now we need to react not in cycles, but in milliseconds, in maybe even a fraction of a millisecond. So therefore, all these traditional equipment are being replaced by power electronic equivalents. For example, you have static voltage regulators, you have static reactor power compensators, you have power flow regulators, you have static circuit breakers. All these are power electronic devices and they are all over the grid. This ensures that you now have fast response to any event in the system. So, 
I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, you have a solar plant at one part of the system. And on a sunny day, you are producing a lot of power. And let's say on that sunny day, there wasn't enough load to actually use that amount of system or rather to produce, to absorb the amount of power that is being produced. In that case, if there was a supervisory control and monitoring that detects that such an event is taking place, there is a mismatch of power. In that case, it can turn on a static power flow controller that can charge a battery with all this surplus power. So you are storing the energy for later use, which is only sensible. So this basically is an example of Big Brother is now watching, is watching and controlling the power grid. That's pretty much what a smart grid is. And this is where power electronics comes in. Power electronics are the hands and legs that operate this entire smart grid or make the smart grid smart. We have digital technologies, we have communication, we have monitoring. But all that is no use if you don't have hands and legs that actually do the work. And power electronics are those hands and legs that do the work. So smart grids are going to be the reality, are already the reality and they are going to keep growing in the years to come. And this is an extremely exciting line which will need a lot of power electronics engineers. So with this, I will end this lecture. If you have any doubts, please do post and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you so much and see you soon. Goodbye for now.